Amen. I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to services this morning. These are God's services. This yes. is God's house. Yes. We have several young men in the house today. <clears throat> and so I really want you all to listen very well. Because preaching is a noble calling. Yes. <clears throat> and we need, we need young men in this war, in this battle. Amen. And we need them to look at going and taking this up as a noble cause. Yes. Yes. And I just, I'm just, you know, I, I've had an opportunity to train young men and women, but for the pr purpose of staying contextually sound, we're talking about preaching this morning, so I've had an opportunity to train. When I say train, I'm talking about going back when they were children, when they were, yes. and I'm seeing the fruits of the labor today. Yes. And yes, that they are taking on the challenge and the charge of preaching. Mm -hmm. And we know that a preacher is to be an example. Yes. And not only an example, but a good example. Yes. Yes. He's to be an example in every aspect of his life, <clears throat> in word and conversation and and study and, and everything. He, he's to be a good example. Yes. So when you take on the charge of being a preacher, being a minister, that is a noble calling. Yes. And I know that the world disparages that, the world downplays that, but it is the most important calling in life. And when I say calling, I'm talking about a, a work. I'm talking yes. about a job. Yes. It's the most important job that a man can have on this side of life. I don't care what his other pursuits are, I don't care what his degree attainments are. I don't care about any of that. The most important person <clears throat> in the world is a God-fearing preacher Amen. that's going to tell the world mm -hmm. what they need to know in order to be pleasing to God and to save their soul. Amen. Right. Right. And so we have to remember that. So to our <clears throat> younger brothers who have taken on this charge, I am so encouraging uh, of you by doing this, and I want to encourage you some more today. Amen. Our text is coming from 1 Timothy chapter 1 and the verses 12 and 18, which has been spoken already in your hearing. And Paul said to Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for he has counted me worthy or faithful, putting me into the ministry. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee that thou by them might war a good warfare. So Paul is letting Timothy know that he's in a war. Yes. And church, if I've said before, if you don't know that you're in a war, I want to make it known to you this morning, you are in a war. You're in a war for your soul. Yes. You are in a war to push forth the mighty word and name of God yes. in a world where there is a fallen being known as Satan, Lucifer, the devil and all of the other names that are assigned to him. He cares nothing about me. He cares nothing about you. He cares nothing about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, his church. He does not care anything about humanity. So as we are aware of this evil force, when you go back and you look through the annals of time and see what he has done to God's creation, countless and millions and trillions of gallons of blood have been spilled because of this enemy that has come up against humanity. And I know that he's deceiving the world, telling everyone that going to church is, is secondary or not that important. He has people convinced that their jobs and raising families and all other endeavors in life, their wants, their likes, their hobbies, their interests are more important than serving God. Amen. Let me say this to you. When you go back through the annals of time, you can go back and think of all of the great men that you can call. Every one of them are dead. Amen. All of those who have uh, even secured a conquering of the world. When you go back to Pharaoh who was ruling in Egypt, he, he, was, he was the ruler of the world, might as well say. You go back to Nebuchadnezzar, at one point God gave him so much dominion, he was basically ruling the world. You go back and you study about all these other uh, leaders, Napoleon and, and, and uh, uh, Hitler and all of the rest of them. They want to rule the world. But Jesus said long ago, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, once we die, it does not matter who we were, 
or what we had or wh who we thought we were on this side of life. Right. When you go over to the book of Luke and you read about that rich man who died, when he got down there on hell or Hades side of life, he was nothing. Right. He, he, wanted, he thought he still had some bounce in his, in his voice to tell Abraham what to do about getting some security <laughs> for his discomfort. Abraham didn't even allow Lazarus to even speak to the man. Abraham was doing the talking, and, and he told him, he said, Rich man, while you were living, you had your good things, yes, sir. but it's all over now. Yes. Now, Lazarus, even though he was over here, he was being overlooked, neglected, rejected, and dejected, and everything else, now he's in comfort, and now you're in torment. Yes. Now, so the point is, what's the point, preacher? The rich man, he encouraged his brothers and his families and all that would listen to him in his time of living he encouraged everybody to turn away from God. He encouraged his family and his loved ones to not pay Moses and the prophets no attention. Right. He convinced them that the world's pursuits were more important. He right. convinced them that everything else was more important than obeying God. Mm -hmm. But the book said he died. Yes, yes he did. He died. Mm -hmm. And when he died then it came to be a realization in his mind that all that I thought was important really was not worth anything. Mm -hmm. And Solomon told us that over in the book of Ecclesiastes, that all of this stuff that we're searching for and seeking is nothing but vanity and a vexation of the spirit. Amen. So he's saying simplify your life. But who did Abraham tell him was trying to tell him about God? He said, nobody's coming back from the dead to tell you what to do, Mr. Rich Man. Nobody. Because when you were living, there was a preacher over there on life. Yes, it was Moses and the prophets. Yes. And you paid him no mind. Yes. You, you, you relegated the preacher. You relegated the man of God to being insignificant in your life. Mm -hmm. You rewarded your, yourself and all of those that were, would bow down to you with money, name, fame, and acclaim because you thought that was the it and the, and the end thing. Oh, but now you did and you didn't listen to the preacher. That's right. The preacher, the preacher, a God-fearing preacher, everybody needs one in his life. Amen. Amen. You got insurance policies, you have insurance on your house, insurance on your cars, insurance on your health, insurance when you get old and need a uh, living benefit and so forth to take care of you. But people are leaving the man of God, they're leaving God, they're leaving the word of God out of their life. And I can guarantee you, you're going to need some fire insurance. And that's obeying God. Because if we don't obey God, you're going to burn. You're going to burn forever in that lake of fire. Now, in dealing with uh, preaching a noble call, we're going to first of all deal with the call. You see, the scripture text addresses the call for, Ab for Timothy to preach God's word, yes. to stay focused. On God's word and not on endless stories or fables. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in the verses of 4 through 5, the book says, What? Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. And endless genealogies which, minister questions, which minister questions. Rather than godly edifying. Godly edifying. Which is in faith. Which is in faith. So do. So do. Now the end of the commandment the is charity. The commandment is love. Out of a pure heart, out of a pure heart, and of good conscience, and of a good conscience, and of good and of faith unfeigned, and of faith unfeigned. It is not cloaked. It is not disguised. It is. It is not. You know, taking on a, a hypocritical stance. He you know he wants us to have faith that is real, as the brother said in his prayer. He wants us to have love in our heart for God that is real. Yes. So the call, Timothy had to receive. The call. Somebody said, well, preacher, how are you called? Thessalonians 2.14, we're all called by the gospel. Amen. Matthew 22, verse 14, the Bible says, many are called, but chosen a few. Yes. So now, so when God calls all of us, That's right. we come in and we, we study. We should be diligent. We're going to find that out in the lesson today. We should be diligent in our studies. Listen, yes. I know we all, as I said in my prelude, that we have a lot going on in life. But Listen, I don't believe it's anybody in here that can put their schedule up against mine. And when I say against mine, I'm talking about for an extended period of time. I'm talking about a schedule for the last 30 years. I'm talking about doing all the stuff. I'm not going to go through it today. I don't have to. You already know it. Right. Now, and doing it all at the same time. 
for 30 years. And, and if, when we look at each individual one, I want to find somebody that outworked me in one of the areas. So out of several things, for several years of heavy-minded work to do, Amen. emotionally conflicting work to do, heavy work, not just passive work, no, no, not what stuff is just established and it's running so smooth, no, building work, rebuilding work. Yes. To where, like I said before, if anybody else going through one of them, they'd be good not to have a heart attack or a stroke. Right. Or be on drugs. But God had me doing five of them at the same time for 30 years. What's the point I'm getting at? Don't come to me complaining or making no excuses on why you can't study. That's right. Amen. I don't want to hear it. That's Amen. Right. Because with everything that God has had me doing at the same time, and when I said tough, I mean tough. But able to get up here, I used to, I used to years ago, I used to get up here and quote just about everything come out my mouth. I'm talking chapters. Now, and so if, if I'm able with everything else that's going on plus raising a family mm -hmm. and able to study and find time to study and exercise. I sit and hear people holler, but I don't have time to exercise. I just sit and look at folks. Mm -hmm. I just sit and look at them. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to myself, you don't get fit like this by not making time for yourself. Right. You have to make time. Right. You have to prioritize what's important. Right. I've been preaching and teaching that for years. But Paul is saying you're going to have to study. So in order to receive the call, you got to study. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. where I'm going. And the call, when you study, is going to develop a more in-depth relationship with God. Yes. Yes. And what God is going to do in that relationship, he's going to equip you. He's going to bless you. He's going to give you what you need in order to do what he has assigned for you to do. Now, that's why I was able to do it. Now, somebody said, Dijanette, what are you doing? The Bible charged me to be an example. Yes. And so, so for somebody that wants to make the excuse that they can't be all that they can be in the army, you're talking to the wrong one. That's, right. That's the point I'm making. I'm not up here bragging. I'm, I'm using the charge that God gave me to be your example yes. so that I can preach to you effectively this morning. Amen. So now, he goes on. Now he moves to the challenges. He's telling uh, Timothy... That when you take this noble call, mm -hmm. it's going to be loaded with challenges. Yes. It's got challenges and plenty of them. You see, he, he was challenged to teach the people about proper attire and their leadership responsibilities when it comes to how to properly dress and so forth. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, in the verses 9 through 15, he lays out also that he wanted men to pray everywhere, lifting up, holding hands, yes. without wrath and doubting. He wants men to be in leadership. That's right. Men. Now, appointment of elders. He had the challenge of appointing elders and deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the verses of 1 through 13. I see some prospects of people who have made mention years ago that they strive and to be an elder one day. And they are working toward it. They are working toward it. And I'm just so tickled to that they have, first of all, the desire to want to be an elder. Amen. But in order to be an elder, Paul told Timothy what the re requirements were for, for, to serve as an elder. Yes. And so now the preacher, what is his job? His job is to teach young men what their responsibilities are to be an elder, to be a deacon. Yes. Yes. So now that's my job. I got to teach them and I got to train them. That's right. And when the day and time comes for some to be put forth to the congregation, for me to appoint them and you to approve them, and then we do the work, then... At that time, when we are ready to do so, I'll know that they are ready. But Paul said, lay hands on no man suddenly. Yeah. In other words, you don't go get nobody just for the sake of putting a hot butt in a seat. you got to make sure that they are ready, willing, and able. Yes, right. You see, then also, we have the challenges of battling evil forces of humanity. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, where he goes on to say that in the latter time, some are going to uh, depart from the faith, giving uh, heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, teaching things which they ought not 
commanded to, to abstain from marrying and from eating certain meats which ought to be eaten as long as it's received with thanksgiving and so forth. Paul is making it clear of the challenges now that you're going to have to address, young preacher. So now, preaching is a noble call. Yes. But you're going to have to receive the call. Yes. And then you're going to, Paul is, is preparing this young man to deal with the challenges that come along with it. I can tell you all about the challenges, a lot of which you've already witnessed from being under my leadership here at this congregation. But you got to have big feet, man. You can't be no punk. You can't be no sissy. You can't be coddled by a woman. Now, women in, in their uh, makeup, they, they are nurturers and so forth, and that's good. But, but in order to do this job, somebody petting, rubbing, and, and, and and coddling you and pacifying you, they're not preparing you for this work. That's right. It takes another man to teach another man, a young man, what to do to fulfill the requirements of being a preacher in God's house. Yes. Amen. It takes another big foot man to teach a young man how to be a man. Yes. So we thank the women for what they've done, but we have to pull you off uh, the breast. Yes. we got to get you off the breast. Yes. And come on over here and get some training where another Bigfoot man can teach you That's how to be a man. And to be a man of God, preaching God's word to God's people. Yes. Is that all right? Yes. All right. So now, when we, when we start shaping, molding, and, and getting men ready for this work, then women, I have a sixth sense. I can tell when, when you, oh, oh, I can tell. I already know. You don't have to say nothing. I don't have to say nothing. I've already read you up and down. I got insight on steroids. So now, we're not going to let you pump these men. That's the point I'm getting at. You see, to be a good minister, he was charged to do something. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, and the verses 6 and 7, the book said, What? If thou put the brethren in remembrance if of these things. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ. Nourished up in the words Nourished of faith. Nourished up in the words of faith. And of good doctrine. And good doctrine. Whereunto thou hast attained. Whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise faith. Pro refuse profane and old wise faith. And exercise thyself rather and unto exercise godliness. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Yes. You see, so what did Paul just said to Timothy, what I just told you in paraphrase. Paul told Timothy, told if he's going to be a good man of God, you're going to have to quit, get away from this negative female energy. And if you're going to be a good man of God, don't sit around and listen to a bunch of old cackling women. That's what he's telling them. Can I just go ahead and be plain here? Yes, sir. You see, if you're going to be a man of God, don't sit around men... And, and, and let your energy turn feminine and you listening to a bunch of women and old wives fables. No, no. Uh-uh. He said, no, that's, that's not the way this got to go. You see, Paul warned Timothy that he would be talked about and that he would be despised in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 12. And that's where he told him, let no man despise thy youth. In other words, young men, when you are scribing to be one of God's preachers, people are going to look to despise you they're going to look to despise your youth. Now, at this point, somewhere around in there, the history is correct. Timothy was about 40 years old, but that was considered to be young. So he wasn't no teenage or 20-year-old. No, he was a 40-year-old man, but he was considered to be young. He was considered to be a son under Timothy for Timothy, uh, converting him to the faith and, and preparing him to be a, a Bigfoot preacher one day. Amen. But there were older men who thought that they had seniority or whatever, whatever, through vanity. Hear me well. Through vanity. Now, the Bible, we know that older men are a great resource, and right. God said that the older men should teach the younger, and the older women should teach the younger women. Right. But these men were foolish, and they thought that their age was the difference of the category when it's coming down to working in the Lord's kingdom. No, 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 not age. And Paul is telling them to make sure that they understand and you understand that age is not the determiner of your duties. Yes. Yes. You be a big foot man even if you have to set the old one straight. That's right. You see now, but in order to do this, you got to be committed. So now we're dealing with the commitment. So now you have the call, you have the challenges, 
but you have the commitment. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, the verses of 13 through 15, the book says what? Till I come, Till I come give attendance to reading. Give attendance to reading. To exhortation. Exhortation. To doctrine. To doctrine. Pause. Young men, men, in here. You can have a desire to be a preacher. You can have a desire to be a worker in the Lord's work. But you cannot do it if you're going to neglect the commitment. Amen. You have to be committed to this. This is not a haphazard, laissez-faire operation here. Right. Amen. There has to be a commitment, a yes. commitment to studying God's word. Yes. Yes. There has to be a commitment here. Now, he says, till I come, give attendance to reading. You're going to have to read. Yes. To exhortation and to doctrine. Yes. You have to do that. Yes. Read on. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now he said you have a gift. You also are gifted. When you were baptized into the uh, church of Christ, into the body of Christ, God presented you with a gift. Yes. He said, now don't neglect it. Read. Which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Read. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Pause. Now, to those in here who sometimes, during your course of your day, you've done some reading. Mm -hmm. Okay, reading is a different thing from yes. studying. Right. 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 Reading is reading the information. Okay, that's fine. But now Paul is telling Timothy to do what with the information that he's read? Yes. Meditate on. Yes. So when you are meditating, yes, sir. that is studying. Matter of fact, that is study. It's, it's, for those of us, I'm in the education profession, so this is what I do, and I've had to take test after test after test after test, and from all of the degrees and so forth. Once you read the stuff, mm -hmm. you read it, mm -hmm. read it. Mm -hmm. You don't learn it right. until you've meditated on it. Mm -hmm. My brain was so sharp. I had somewhat of a photographic memory. I could go and play ball. We'd go play ball all over. Florida, Georgia, uh, some everywhere. I could come back and take my notebook. It'd be 30 pages of notes, front and back. I could read them notes and, and just about verbatim remember everything on them 30 pages of notes. Get up the next morning and go take that test and, and knock it out. When I went and, and got my uh, master's degree, we had to take final comps and so forth. And they don't give, they don't tell you what the final three or four questions are going to be, but they make you study all eight or ten questions. My brain, giving God the glory, was so sharp. I remember three, four, five, six pages per question. Verbatim. 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 So one question had uh, front and back <coughs> notes, and I wrote it in a narrative. If you if you were to if I were to give you that paper with that narrative on it, I'll start talking and tell you everything on that paper verbatim. And when I got there and I looked at the the the, the questions, my mind, God triggered my mind to go back and write down every bit of that stuff, front and back pages, and so forth and whatever. What I'm trying to say to you is, we are blessed with a gift. Yes, yes. When you obey God. When you obey the gospel, you're blessed with a gift. Yes. Now, Paul told Timothy to neglect the gift. Meditate upon these things. Neglect. Don't neglect the gift. And you right. meditate on the things which you read. Right. The point I'm getting at, it, that's when you are studying. Yes. Read on. That thy profiting may appear to all. That thy profiting may appear to all. That's right. So, therefore, he's telling Timothy, when you put in the time, mm -hmm. When you've done the reading, when you've done the meditating, and in order to meditate, you're going to have to get off in a quiet place somewhere. Yes, sir. Or put earplugs in your ear. Yes. Or get over in a quiet place. Now, other people who don't know what's going on, they're going to think you're just staring up at the stars or, or whatever. And they'll even kind of somewhat even pick at you or laugh at you or whatever. But Paul said, don't pay that no mind. Right. You need time right. to meditate. Now, to our young ministers' wives, you have to, the Bible charge you to care for that home. Hear me well, I'm just preaching the gospel. 
your husband is not your babysitter. Your husband is not your babysitter. Amen. There are some things that you're going to have to do without him being right there holding your hand. You won't have to go do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Not going and interrupting him over frivolous stuff over and over and over again. Amen. A am, I, am I talking to anybody in here? Amen. Yes. Amen. The man needs time to think. So when it looks like he's doing nothing, if he's doing what the Bible teaches, which is meditating and studying on what he has read, yes. I remember my children, my wife too. They said, I didn't see you study. Mm -hmm. I know you didn't see it. But when I got up here and went to preaching and ripping off these scriptures and running off chapters, somebody had to be doing some study. Amen. Some meditating had to be going on. And so you have to, hear me well, get a hold of yourself. Yes. Get a hold of your past emotional pains and hurts and burdens. Mm -hmm. You looking for him to be the fixer of everything going on with you, but he has a responsibility of things that he has to do. Right. Now, get yourself together, listen to the preaching, which is a noble call. Yes. And listen to what the Bigfoot preacher teaching you on how to identify your emotional burdens and pains from the past. Start implementing those things for yourself. That's something you got to do. That's right. You can't keep going running to him, wanting him to fix it, and you're not willing to fix your own problem. Right. I'm giving you all of the remedy. I'm telling you what to do. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to exercise. You're going to have to burn off negative energy every day. Hear me well. You're going to have to burn up negative energy every day. Yes. You have enough impact in you every day you got to burn it up. Yes. You're going to have to do some. I don't care if it's walking in place. I don't care what it is. Amen. Raise your hand up. Just just walk and burn it up. Do, do some whatever. Get one a rhythm. Do something. Turn the radio on. You ain't got to go to no gym. Just get, just get to moving. Right. I guarantee you, if you work hard enough, the the uh, the workout gonna consume so much of your mind, you ain't gonna have time to think about the foolishness that's got you jacked up. Right, right. You're gonna be worried about trying to breathe. Amen. You're gonna be worried about trying to catch your breath. Right. And so while you're trying to do that, guess what it did? It pushed out the negativity over here that don't matter where a hill of beans. Yes. But if you're gonna sit up. And be lazy. Can I talk straight with you? Talk no. You're going to sit up and be lazy. And make all the excuses in the world for why you can't do what you need to do for you. Right. But then want to worry the man over here. You want to worry him. Come look at this. Come do this. I need you for this. I need you for that. Say amen, women. Amen. Do I got godly women in here? Amen. I know I'm going down these aisles today. You want him to do everything. And then if he can't do it, then you got your lips poked out because you think he's neglecting you. Oh, I'm up in here. Yes. <laughs> you see, he, he, what I'm trying to say, he's got things he has to do. Amen. And you're going to have to address your burden. And you're going to have to address your pains. Let me say this as I'm going by this. I enjoyed that lesson this morning in Sunday school. And it was dealing about sex in the marriage. Mm -hmm. It's healthy sexual relations. Yes. Now, a man, he can be stimulated by a woman mm -hmm. and by the attributes that she brings to the game. But I want you to know something, young ladies. That if that man's mind is burdened yes. and overtaxed yes. with cares, worries, and stress, yes. you can come in there butterball naked and he ain't going to move. Mm -hmm. His mind is consumed. Mm -hmm. Can I talk straight? Yes. His mind is consumed. Nothing you have is of interest to him. Right. Now, you think, well... You, you just don't love me no more, and, and do I turn you on, and, and this, that, and the third? You see, you're not listening, because that ain't the problem. Right. 
You turning him on ain't got nothing to do with his head being full of stress that he hadn't had a chance to decompress on to, to, for himself to be at a place to be aroused and stimulated to take care of you right. intimately. Right. You see, you, you, you have to take care of some things and help this man take care of some things in order for him to take care of some things. Right. Yes. Right. And if you're not going to help him to take care of some things, then you're just going to be the one going without. You're going to have to, you're going to, you're going to, have to start addressing some of your own issues. Mm -hmm. All right. Is this all right? Yes, all right. Right. Amen. All right. <clears throat> now, the charge. He gave Timothy a charge. And every young preacher has a charge. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 18, the book says, what? This charge I commit to thee. Listen at this. He, he, all through the, all this lesson I'm giving you today as I'm getting ready to bring this lesson down, these are charges all through the lesson of, of a, to a young preacher that Paul has given him. Go back and start it again. Verse 18, the book says, what? This charge I commit to thee. This charge I commit to thee. That thou might war a good warfare. That thou might war a good warfare. And you can't go and fight in nobody's battle if you're not... Uh, prepared right. to fight the battle. Amen. All right, so you're going to have to help him be prepared to fight the battle. And if, <clears> if you take off the little knick knacky pity whack packing whatever <laughs> off his plate, that'll help a whole lot. Mm -hmm. In First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 7, and charges and what? And these things give in charge Three. that they may be blameless. That they may be blameless. And what he was talking about there is taking care of elderly loved one. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verses 21, the book says, What? I charge thee before God. I charge thee before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ. And the elect angels. The elect angels. That thou observe these things that thou without preferring one. Things, without preferring one another. Doing nothing by partial, doing partiality. Nothing by partiality. When you go back and get the context, context of that, he was dealing with rebuking the elders. When it's yes. time to set our elders straight, yes. the preacher is charged to rebuke him and set yes. him straight. Yes. All right. So now let's get to First Timothy chapter six, thirteen and fourteen. The book says, "What I give thee charge in the sight of God. I give thee charge in the sight of God. That thou keep this commandment that thou without keep spot. This commandment without spot. Unrebukable. Unrebukable. Unto the appearing of our Lord Until Jesus Christ. The appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this had to do. This charge here was for him to keep the good confession of which he had confessed the name of Christ. Right. So he told him, now I'm charging you to maintain this good confession." And so therefore, young brothers in here who are taken on the mountain of teaching and preaching God's word, Paul is charging us to maintain a good confession. Amen. Yes, yes, sir. Don't get sidetracked. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18, the book says, What? Charge them that are rich in this world. Charge them that are rich in this world. That they be not high-minded. That they be not high-minded. Nor trust in uncertain riches. Nor trust in uncertain riches. But in, living, in the living God. But in the living God. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Richly all things to enjoy, Paul. This is what I was saying earlier on. You remember when I was talking about the rich man in Lazarus? Yes. You see, the preacher's job is to make sure that people who are rich in this world, he didn't say that you couldn't be rich. No, no. When you go back up earlier in that chapter, he's talking about uh, that the uh, man's problem is the love of money. Yes, sir. The love of money. So now he comes back and says that, hey, if you peradventure are rich, that's a good thing. Just don't trust but here are some responsibilities that go along with the money. Yes. Yes. It's not for you to hoard. Yes. It's not for you to allow it to puff you up in vanity. Right. Or to get you to even turn so foolish that you hard to be around. Right. No. He says now use the resource that God has given you and bless others with. Right. Right. Read. That they do good, and that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. So the preacher's job is to teach people how to manage finances. You see, the preacher, he has a dynamic role. He has a dynamic job. It's not just, you're not just, church, hear me well, you're not just hiring a man to just open up the book and regurgitate out the verses. No, he, he's got to do that. But he also has to allow God to equip him with skill sets right. and knowledge for him to impart on and to God's people. Amen. 
And so he has a dynamic job. You got to learn a little bit about everything to be an effective preacher. Now, the conclusion. You see, the job of a minister is, re is a rewarding work. Like everything else, it has its share of challenges and headaches. But it is the most important job on this earth. God places a high level of significance on the preacher and a high degree of condemnation if he misuses his influence for sinister motives. Many, many preachers will be condemned to the lake of fire in the day of judgment of Christ because they were not honest and led people in the wrong direction, Revelation 20 and 10. Honest preachers who are committed to preaching but who have been misled in some areas, God will redirect with patience. But he must heed the correction of God or be subjected to the same fate as the false prophet. Young men, please heed the call of God and prepare yourself to be one of God's great preachers. Mm -hmm. It is a rewarding work that allows you to influence generations for God's purpose and, in, and enjoy rich relationships among people. I want to say Paul's correctly right here. Being a, a minister, being just a, a, a minister, a community leader and so forth, has been a blessing to me. Yes. It's been a blessing because it has allowed me to live a rich life. Mm -hmm. When people invite you into the most intimate times of their life, whether in sickness or in health, whether at momentous times, whether it is at anniversaries, weddings, and, and celebrations, the like, for people to think enough of you to invite you to these occasions is a blessing, a privilege, and an honor. Amen. For people to want you there in the passing of their loved one or in sickness at the hospital bed, that's a blessing. For people to want you to be at their 50th wedding anniversary, that's a blessing. For people who want you at their baby celebration, first birthday, shower, whatever, that is a blessing. What I'm saying to you young people, young men, hear me well. It is a blessing to be a man of God. Amen. It is a blessing to be a preacher. Amen. It's a blessing. Don't let nobody fool you and tell you that it is not a rewarding work. It is. Amen. It is a beautiful work. It's a beautiful life. And it, it is well worth it. And I want to encourage all who, who God is working on to let God use you. Yes. The world at large, communities and families, suffer tremendously when they reject God and those who are appointed to minister to them. Stating this, congregations, hear me well now, church, I'm talking to you, must be obedient, accept their responsibilities to the preacher, and do their part to encourage and minister to his needs. Mm -hmm. If not, the church falls into the danger of losing capable men who refuse to enter the profession because of what they witnessed growing up, seeing how other preachers were mistreated. You see, what happens in that case, the church puts itself on, in a place of peril by the way it is treating or mistreating the minister that they have, and young men growing up, they're not saying a mumbling word, but they're watching the way Older men are mistreating the preacher. They're watching how older women are mistreating the preacher. They're watching the hell you put the preacher through for no reason. They're watching all of this. They're watching how you either pay them or don't pay them. They're watching how you either take care of them on certain times or don't take care. They are watching every bit of it and they, are, they have it on record. They hear the conversations in your house of how you talk about the preacher. Now, this ain't talking about me now. We've crossed this bridge. And I'm, I'm committed to preach regardless of how they act. I've already proved that. Amen. So this ain't dealing with me. I'm speaking broadly and I'm speaking generally. But they are hearing the conversations at the dinner table while people are talking about the church and about the preacher. Now, when they get big and they get grown and they have had a chance to witness, they ain't paying them nothing, don't want to pay them nothing. If they do pay them something, it's with a grudge. 
They don't do nothing for him. His wife, nobody, don't send him on no trip, vacation, nothing. Now, that's the, that we, we have improved in this area. I'm not talking to you. Amen. This is a broader message. <clears throat> but they are watching. What I'm trying to say to you as a congregation, they are watching. And then when you get up and now nobody wants to go into the profession. Oh, these young boys, now I tell you what, they just so sorry, I just don't know what. No, no, no. If you gave the young boy a chance to tell you what's really going on, he gonna come back and watch your face and what he saw you doing, how you talked about the man of God, he gonna come back and watch your face and how you neglected the man of God. He gonna come back and watch your face on how you didn't want to do nothing for the man of God. So now he gonna get you off of him. I'm fine. Y'all the one, the reason why I don't want to go into this profession. That's right, preacher. Amen. Why y'all so quiet? <laughs> Why y'all so, I ain't heard, hey man, preach brother, go ahead man, I ain't heard none of that this morning. Am I preaching Greek up here? No. <laughs> <laughs> Talk back to me. I put in a lot of time, I just told y'all I have to do a lot of effort, reading, meditating, studying, memorization, I got to do a whole lot of stuff. Talk back to me. Man, you preach the word. But well, young men, I want to encourage you from your preacher to you. Consider being a preacher one day. Don't run from the call. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. Just because you eight, nine years old, you'll already know when God working on you. Amen. You're going to already know when God is tagging at you to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. If I can be personal for just a minute and I'm through. Big man knew it when he was a young boy. And when he would kind of go out and get outside of himself and so forth and whatever, and well, he knew accountability had to take its place. We got to come back in here to the living room. We got to talk anyway, baby. Me, you, and your mama, and Tan, too, would be there. And then he'd just break out and say, I don't want to be no preacher. <laughs> I said, me and Jack, we sitting there looking. Who told you you got to be a preacher? I hadn't put no demands on you to follow in my footsteps to be no preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. I just know that's what the Lord wants me to do. <laughs> and so he was, he was running. He was running. He was running from me. He couldn't hide. And I'm going to say to you as I go to my seat now, you know when God is tugging at you to be a preacher. Amen. Yes. And I talked to one of my little men back the, the other day when, we, when he was going out. I said, I already see a preacher in you. I said, I already see you being one of God's preachers. He said, yes, sir. <laughs> so don't neglect the call. Amen. And when God has appointed you and singled you out to do his work, I want you to know something. That you're not going to... You are not going to be able to get away with what everybody else got away with. No, sir. God not going to allow. Not at all. <laughs> you go do what somebody else trying to do. You going to always be the one. Yes. Find it out. That's figured out. <laughs> that's listen. You you yes. think that's the old folk? You yes. think that's folks always talent on you? You think that's no, <laughs> no. That's God. Yes. God seeing to it yes, sir. that every move you make, I'm going to make sure that I got you. And some of the stuff you want to do, I had dreams, I had aspirations, I had all that stuff, but God said, no, Greg, that's not the way you're going. Amen. I'm leading you in this direction. It's going to be confusing. You're going to be confused. You're going to be like, why in the world? Why is this? Why is this? Why is this? You're going to be even angry. But now that I'm older, I can look back in life and say, God, yes, sir. I see it. Mm -hmm. You didn't allow for this. You didn't allow for that. You allowed this to happen at yes. this time. You, yes. you did it. And, and now I'm up here preaching this word and leading hundreds of people to the gospel, if not thousands. Mm -hmm. So you see what God is doing for you. So I just want you to know that when you're trying to do what you're trying to do and it's not working, I'm just letting you know. God is in the equation. Yes, 
And he's not going to allow for you to do what you want to do. He's going to prepare you for his good work. Yes. That ain't almost get up close to it, just about it. That's it. That's it. That's it. You come to the Lord by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Give me your hand. Give God your heart. And I want you to heed the noble call of coming and obeying Christ. And then for those who are in here today who are men, you already know God tapping on you. I need you to come and be one of my men. While together we stand and sing, won't you come? Don't you want?